Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to uh, the Institute of Global Prosperity. Um, for those who don't know me, and I can see a few unfamiliar names uh, on the uh, attendee list, my name is Dr. Christopher Harker. I'm Director of Research at the Institute for Global Prosperity. Uh, and it's very, my very great pleasure to welcome you to today's seminar. Um, this seminar is part of a broader series looking at modelling natural prosperity for the future. And in this series, we're interested in forms of modelling, monitoring and measurement across different times and spaces um, that allow us to apprehend uh, and to anticipate the climatic and ecological uh, futures that we are collectively moving towards. And of course, at IGP, we're interested in how do we generate effective forms of policy uh, and practice to enable and enact the forms of natural prosperity that we so urgently want and indeed need. And I can think of absolutely no one uh, more qualified uh, and more suited to uh, speak to the themes of this series than uh, one of our newest uh, staff members, uh, Professor Robert Constanza. Um, Professor Constanza is going to give a talk entitled Natural Capital, Ecosystem Services and Sustainable Wellbeing. Um, but before he does, I'm going to give you a quick introduction. Um, so, Robert, uh, sorry, <clears throat> excuse me, Professor Constanza was uh, previously the Vice Chancellor's Chair in Public Policy at the Crawford School of Public Pol Policy at the Australian National University. He, in addition to being a uh, Professor of Ecological Economics at the IGP, is also a Senior Fellow at the Stockholm Resilience Centre and an Affiliate Fellow fellow at the Gund Institute at the University of Vermont and also a Day Tao Master of Ecological Economics at the Day Tao Masters Academy in Shanghai, China. He's a fellow in the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia, the Royal Society of Arts in the UK and an overseas expert in the Chinese Academy of Sciences. So, as you might imagine from that uh, illustrious list of awards and positions, Professor Constanza really is uh, an expert in transdisciplinary approaches to humans and nature and their interactions. Um, he served as the co-founder and past president of the International Society for Ecological Economics and was the founding chief editor of the society's journal, Ecological Economics. And I think um, colloquially is, is known as one of the, the kind of co-fathers of the discipline. Um, so there are, there's a huge list of, of other accomplishments that I could read out, but we'll be here till six o'clock if I do. So, uh, Bob, many, many thanks for giving today's talk. I'm really fascinated to hear what you've got to talk about, and I'll hand over the floor to you. Welcome. Thanks. Thank you very much, Chris. And uh, it's really great to be here. Um, and I think I have a, a lot of slides, probably too many. So I think I'm going to go ahead and just start by sharing my screen. And hopefully we'll leave some time for questions at the end. Uh, let's see. And hopefully you're seeing the intro slide. We, we can't yeah. just yet, no. Now can you? No, it's not appearing for me. No, yeah, <clears throat> this this is we for the audience. We literally it. practiced this two minutes ago. It worked perfectly. <laughs> as seems okay, to be okay. One more time. Let's see. Uh, let's try that screen. How yes. about now? Yes. Yeah, we can see all of this. Yeah, now we've got full screen. Perfect. Okay. Cool. Okay, so natural capital ecosystem services and sustainable well-being. Um, first of all, to recognize that uh, we all live in a whole new geologic epoch, uh, the, the Anthropocene. Uh, I'm sure you've heard this term before. Um, because of the magnitude of the human impact uh, on our ecological life, life support system, 
going forward. I think the implications are that really business as usual is no longer an option. Uh, if we really want to create a sustainable and desirable anthrop Anthropocene, I think we need to think and act differently. We need to take a much more systems approach. And I think the time is now really uh, to make this transition uh, to an economy and a society that's based on a different goal, on the goal of sustainable well-being of humans and the rest of nature and recognizing that interdependence between humans and the rest of nature. We're not unnatural. Uh, we are part of this complex natural global system. So we've got to start taking that more seriously. And it's going to take some, some work. Uh, <clears throat> it's going to take having an adequate vision, first of all, of how the world is. You know, so our scientific understanding of the world. And this is certainly making a lot of progress here in understanding, you know, earth system science, also in understanding human psychology, you know, the whole field of positive psychology, what actually does contribute uh, to individual well-being, but also well-being at, at multiple different scales up to the scale of planetary well-being. Um, <clears throat> and also, I think we need a, an adequate vision of how we would like the world to be, you know, what's our vision for the future? What kind of world are we trying to create? Uh, so I think that's that's an a, an essential element of achieving this world is creating an adequate vision of what it is that we're actually trying to do. Um, our tools and analytical techniques I think need to be then consistent with that evolving understanding and vision, and I think that's going to involve a lot more systems thinking and modeling, uh, looking at the whole system, not just the individual parts. Uh, academia is traditionally not that great at doing this, but I think that's where. Uh, we need a lot more work. And finally, our implementation strategies. And I think that's going to take some new institutions and some societal therapy, as I'll talk about uh, at the end. So we know that the world is a complex, nonlinear, adaptive system. There are thresholds, there are tipping points, there are surprises. It's, it's complicated. Uh, and I think we're beginning to understand that complexity. We're beginning to realize that, that some of these tipping points may really cause some, some issues on the, on the climate front. And we're getting, we're getting to see probably some of those implications uh, right now. We know that because of those nonlinearities, non we need to define you know, what are the, what's the safe operating space? Where are the, where are the planetary boundaries you know, within these ecological constraints uh, that we can continue to, uh, to operate? Uh, <clears throat> you've probably seen some version of this, of this diagram and this, and this paper uh, somewhere, you know, that climate change, the, uh, biodiversity loss, biogeochemical flows, all of these things are well outside the safe operating space and, and others are, are rapidly approaching that. But just recognizing and dealing with, with that, the, you know, the biophysical world is not infinite. Uh, we have to recognize the constraints. And we know that there are some trajectories that we're on that are probably not, not going to be that pleasant. Uh, so, you know, how do, how do we make this transition? Uh, to a climate that's more that's more stabilized and, and avoid uh, the, the tipping point into what have, what's been called hot house hot house earth. Uh, <clears throat> of course, um, <clears throat> yeah, that's not the movie that a lot of people are lining up to go see. Unfortunately, uh, oh, so, can <clears throat> can I ask? Are, are your slides supposed to be changing, or because we've got a slide with mapping the Anthropocene? We just. Huh. Checking that us, we're seeing what you're showing. Oh, wait, I wonder why that is. Uh, try taking it off, Bob, and like try minimizing it, putting back on. I'm going to stop sharing and restart again. Hang on one second. Do, do, do. This was working perfectly the time before, was it not? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, we so can, our, yeah, we can see a cue going into a film called okay. The Reassuring Lie. So. Okay, that's the right one. That's the one I'm looking at as well. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> um, yeah, so it is an inconvenient truth and it's, and it's hard to deal with. So I think part of the problem is we need, we need a third movie. Uh, we need a movie that's, that's a, a new vision, a new narrative, you know, about what a sustainable and desirable economy in society and the rest of nature. That's a mouthful, but I think, I think that's really what we're, we're looking for. What does that world look like? Uh, <clears throat> what's a positive vision of, of where we're trying to go? Um, and I think we need a new approach to, you know, how we manage the world uh, in, in a more ecological way. I think that's what ecological economics is all about. Uh, how do we build more of a systems level understanding uh, that looks at, 
at uh, the economy embedded in society, embedded in the rest of nature, that looks at this whole this whole system uh, as as a as a piece and tries to understand those complex interconnections. Uh, so one way of thinking about it is it has these three integrated uh, questions or goals. How do we create an ecologically sustainable scale or size of this economic subsystem? So how do we stay within planetary boundaries, basically? How do we create a socially fair distribution of wealth and resources, both within the current generation of people, but also between the current and future generations, and also between humans and other species? How do we share this planet in a way that, that makes all this whole system function sustainably? And finally, how do we have an economically efficient allocation of resources and wealth? And we know we know that um, the externalities are, are huge. Uh, they're, not, they're not small things. And so the market uh, is probably not giving us an, a very efficient allocation of resources, especially when it comes to natural and social capital, which are, which are, which are not well um, uh, dealt with in, in, uh, by the market allocation mechanism. So we need some new institutions to deal with this. We're, we're, we're probably very far from an efficient allocation, certainly not uh, fair distribution. And, and we're already exceeding the safe operating space. Um, so this, <clears throat> these ideas are shared, I think, by a number of different uh, terms. Uh, and you probably heard some of these around the well-being economy, the, you know, uh, the donut economy, the steady state economy, the circular bioeconomy, the well-being economy, regenerative. So I think there's a lot of activity and thought in this area around things that are quite similar. <clears throat> um, we know that we need to stay within planetary boundaries, but we know that we also need to create the elements of well-being and quality of life, the social floor, as it's been called by, by Kate Rayworth, the, the safe and just operating space. How do we, how do, we do that? <clears throat> I think that's our challenge. Uh, it may be worth taking a step back and seeing what the current vision is. I think that drives a lot of the uh, economic policy these days, the sort of empty world vision of the economy, which uh, you know, is, this is one cartoon version of where you have land, labor, and capital, whoops, uh, <clears throat> the primary factors of production. Land is kind of grayed out here, stop doing that, uh, <clears throat> because it's, um, it's assumed uh, that there's almost perfect substitutability between these, these uh, factors of production. Uh, they're used in, uh, in markets uh, to create marketable goods and services measured by GDP, that's what GDP measures. And those are either consumed in the current period or reinvested to build more capital to make more GDP in the, in the, the next period, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the basic premises here is more is always better. GDP is a good proxy for welfare. This economy can grow forever. You know, scale is not an issue. There's no boundaries that you see in this, in this diagram. There's nothing preventing it from growing forever. Uh, poverty can best be solved with more growth. You just make the pie bigger. And nature is really a sideshow. You don't really see much about land or natural resources in most of these ideas. And private property is, is always best because you're talking about private, privatizable uh, goods and, and services are the, the main thing going on and externalities are, are, are minimal. And uh, <clears throat> welfare is mainly a function of consumption. The more we consume, the better off we are. So that's not the right model, or at least we need a, a highly revised model for um, the full world version in the Anthropocene, uh, <clears throat> we have to recognize that these four basic types of capital assets um, are all required in some more balanced way uh, to produce conventional GDP, but also to produce well-being more broadly conceived. <clears throat> and uh, in addition to built capital, uh, human capital, much more than just labor, but all of our, our, uh, uh, our health and our individual well-being, uh, social capital, all of the interactions among people, uh, our institutions, our culture, our governments, uh, all of the things that, that bind us together, and natural capital, everything else in the world that we didn't have to create, uh, the free gifts of nature, stop doing that. Um, uh, and that uh, well-being uh, is, is at the individual and community and planetary scale is, a, is a, a much more complex function than simply the more we consume, the better off we are. Uh, so we need to take this much more complex picture of how the world works um, into, into account uh, in, this, in the Anthropocene. We need to have a much more complex understanding of what contributes to quality of life as well. Here's one, one way of thinking of some of the elements, that there are some basic human needs that people have talked about, going back to Maslow, but more recently, Manfred Max Neef and Barbara Nussbaum and, and uh, Amartya Sen. Uh, there's a, a long and, and various list, but it's much more than simply consumption or subsistence. 
you know, security, affection, understanding, leisure, spirituality, creativity, all of these things contribute to people's sense of, of life satisfaction and well-being, which can be surveyed. Oops. Uh, and there's been a lot of research surveying subjective well-being, ask, asking people, you know, on a scale of one to ten, how satisfied are you with your life? And that's that's going to vary depending on people's personalities, on their cultures, on their et cetera, et cetera. But still, it's a way of getting at <clears throat> how satisfied are people. What we can do from a policy perspective, though, is to create the opportunities for people to meet those needs to feel this subjective well-being by how we arrange our, our assets, our built, our human, our social, and our natural capital, and how we, how we use our time. So understanding how all these things contribute, I think, is the, the essence of what we're, we're trying to do here. Of course, one of the main contributors and what I'll focus on today uh, is the contributions of natural capital and the ecosystem services uh, that natural capital contributes to the benefits that people derive from functioning ecosystems. I hope that you have all have heard this term before. Um, maybe some of you have not, uh, but I think it's, it's, uh, it's gaining some traction um, around the world. Uh, <clears throat> this is from the Millennium Assessment uh, from back in 2005, I think. And they categorized and, and lumped these services into these four basic categories of provisioning, regulating, cultural, and supporting services. And you can see some things that are quite familiar, food, water, et cetera, regulating the climate, flood regulation, disease, water purification. There's a whole range of important regulating services, cultural services like recreation and aesthetic appreciation, and then everything that the uh, ecosystems are doing to support those other things and how they contribute to the various constituents of well-being that, that, that I talked about before. Um, one thing that's missing from this diagram is the interaction with the other three types of capital. Because in order to produce that sustainable well-being, I think it requires this interaction be between all of those, those types of capital. Natural capital doesn't create sustainable well-being itself without having some people to, to appreciate it, uh, without having some built infrastructure to, to facilitate it, and ha without having a community to facilitate this interaction. So understanding ecosystem services is really what's the relative contribution of natural capital in this complex interaction uh, to sustainable well-being. It's gonna, it requires you know, a, a very transdisciplinary approach. It's not all about natural ecosystems. It's not all about the, uh, the market economy. Uh, it's not all about social capital. It's about the whole, the whole system and how that, that system interacts and functions. So complicated. <clears throat> um, like I said, there's growing interest in this topic of ecosystem services. There's the IPBES, which is kind of the IPCC equivalent uh, for ecosystem services. You probably uh, heard something about that. Uh, that's producing regular assessments these days, similar to the way the IPCC has functioned. There's the Ecosystem Services Partnership, which is a global uh, organization of researchers and practitioners around the world. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about who's doing what and attending some, some uh, conferences along those lines, take a look at that website. Um, in the academic literature, the number of papers published has been growing exponentially. We're in, it's now up to more than 5,000 uh, know, journal articles a year as, uh, as, as captured by Scopus uh, and, uh, and growing, growing rapidly. Uh, the most highly cited of those papers is this one that we did back in 1997, 25 years ago now, uh, where we took the research that was done at the time in, by, by 1997, tried to uh, <clears throat> uh, synthesize uh, all of that and uh, look at 17 different ecosystem services across 16 different biomes and come up with a rough estimate with a capital E of the total value of those uh, those those services in in monetary units to make it comparable with other things that also contribute to to well-being like GDP and we came up with a number that was significantly larger than global GDP at the time. Uh, <clears throat> so we're not claiming a, a lot of precision for this, but we're claiming that that this is a big deal uh, relative to to I think some of the previous ideas that that these uh, these kinds of components were relatively minor contributors to to well-being. One thing we didn't comp uh, control was what they put on the cover. Um, we did make the cover of the magazine. That was great. Uh, but then they said pricing the planet. And we really meant something more like valuing uh, the planet. Uh, that's what I would prefer, just to make the distinction between price and value and the fact that most of these services are outside uh, the market 
Uh, they're really not captured in, in GDP. I'll, I'll give an estimate of how many or, or what the balance is there, but, but uh, <clears throat> they're not necessarily um, uh, captured in, in market transactions. And that was one of the uh, big criticisms that we got of this paper was, well, how could this number be bigger than GDP? Doesn't GDP capture everything? No, it doesn't, um, as, I, as I pointed out. And um, <clears throat> these are things that, that need to be captured but haven't, haven't been in the past. Um, <clears throat> there's a whole range of uses for this idea of valuing ecosystem services from simply raising awareness and interest to revising national income and well-being accounts. So there's the, 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 uh, the UN's uh, SIA program is, is actively doing things here. I think there's, there's a lot of work still to be done there. Uh, analyzing specific policies, you know, land use planning, how do we create landscapes that really maximize the value of the landscape, including, including all of the assets that we have uh, contributing to our well-being. Um, <clears throat> this idea of payment for ecosystem services, how do we, how do we, how do we incentivize uh, people to, to really uh, uh, continue to produce or, or manage their landscapes uh, to produce ecosystem services in an uh, optimal way. Full cost accounting, we know, you know that because these ecosystem services are a big externality that the market system is not telling us the truth. It's not giving us the true cost of everything that we, that we purchase. Uh, so how do we bring that into the system? And finally, uh, how do we build some new kinds of institutions to manage these systems um, as commons? I'll talk a bit more about that uh, toward the end. Um, some mistaken identities about ecosystem services and valuation. Um, first of all, that you know, economics is not just the market. Uh, and market, the market is just one institution that we have for allocating resources, but it doesn't cover everything that, that economics really should cover, which should be about how do we manage our, our, uh, our, our affairs. Valuation is not, oops, sorry. Valuation is not the same thing as privatization or commodification or trading. I think this is an off, often uh, confused that people jump to that conclusion as soon as you put a value on these, these systems, you're talking about privatizing them. It's just the reverse, actually. Uh, you're talking about recognizing the value of these common goods not, uh, or community goods, not, not uh, privatizing them. And that expressing values in monetary units is not the same thing as using market or exchange values to get the, 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 uh, the value. Uh, it's a way of putting them in units that are comparable and, and, uh, and can communicate. And also we can't avoid valuation because every time we make a decision about ecosystems, we're explicitly uh, valuing them. Uh, so we want to think it will help to make that valuation more explicit and more transparent. Um, there's a whole range of techniques uh, that can be used to, to do this valuation. There's no one right way to do this, I think, but there is a wrong way, which is not to do it at all. Um, <clears throat> but, um, and I won't go through the details of all of these. You're probably familiar with some of them. Uh, some of them are fairly conventional um, <clears throat> sort of environmental economic techniques like con contingent valuation. Uh, some are quite emerging like group valuation. How do we, how do we get whole groups to, to deliberate about what the values of this, these things are? Um, I think we need to take um, uh, a much more sophisticated approach to modeling these systems. Uh, and I think that, that uh, it's also an emerging uh, technique. Uh, <clears throat> I'll give you one quick example uh, using avoided costs, which I think is quite Quite easy to understand, you know, like what's the uh, what what's the cost that we would have incurred if if these ecosystems were not providing the service that we're talking about. Um, I think it's I think there is um, a lot to do in improving valuation as well. Most of the previous work has been toward this goal of economic efficiency that I mentioned at at the beginning, uh, based on current individual preferences, you know, based on ideas about willingness to pay in either current markets or pseudo markets or survey based markets or something like that. Uh, <clears throat> but the other two goals, I think, are equally important, uh, the fairness goal. Uh, and I think to, to get at that, we have to we have to deal with community preferences. And we might think of John Rawls idea of the veil of ignorance. How do we get a, a truly fair and just uh, kind of kind of uh, assessment? of the value of these resources. And it's going to take you know, deliberation. It's going to take a lot of discussion, deliberation, et cetera. And finally, the sustainability goal, I think we need to do a whole lot more systems modeling in order to get at that, because this is what's going to happen over the long term. Uh, we can't get that from surveys of individuals or communities. Uh, <clears throat> we need to do something uh, that's, that's a little more sophisticated. So I think all of these techniques um, need to be applied, and I think there's a lot of work going on in developing uh, in in, the, in this in this space. Um, 
<clears throat> how important is this idea of valuing ecosystem services? This was an interesting survey that was done um, a little while ago. Uh, how important did they think valuation was for this range of different services? You can see they, in general, thought it was either very or, or most are pretty high, highly important, uh, especially and there's, there's some variation. Uh, I'll talk about storm protection. Storm protection was, was ranked fairly highly, uh, <clears throat> but almost all of them uh, they thought was quite, were quite important. Uh, but then they also asked them, how much did they trust these value estimates? And they got a lot less um, support, uh, particularly for some things like option values and non-use values. So I think there's a lot of work still to be done uh, to improve value, these valuation methods, to, to involve more stakeholders and to, and to improve the, um, uh, the trust in these, some of these estimates. I'll run through a very quick um, uh, example uh, that we just published uh, last year on the global value of coastal wetlands for storm protection, just to give you an idea of how, how some of these kinds of valuation studies uh, can get done. Uh, that <clears throat> Ida was a, a, an important co-author on this was, along with, uh, with several others from, uh, from around the world. Uh, <clears throat> basically, uh, we, we know that, the, uh, that, that hurricanes and tropical storms uh, cause significant damage. This is the track of Hurricane Katrina back in 2005. Uh, we know that coastal wetlands uh, in, the, in the path of those storms can reduce storm surge, they can reduce wind speed, they basically reduce damages and, and they reduce deaths um, in, in the areas where they, where they occur. Uh, for example, and we know that, that wetlands have been decreasing globally. Um, here's, here's an example of coastal Louisiana outside of New Orleans. Uh, over the last <clears throat> several decades, um, they have lost a huge amount of the coastal wetlands due to levying the Mississippi River uh, so that the sediments that were building the Steltaic Plain are now going off the edge of the continental shelf, causing other problems as well. Uh, the oil and gas industry has been dredging canals through this, this system and, and disrupting the hydrology. So uh, they've lost a huge amount of coastal wetlands uh, due to those processes. Result of that is storm surges are, are bigger. Uh, this is the storm surge from Hurricane Katrina. It was, it was uh, what, 18 to 20 feet in height when it hit New Orleans. So <clears throat> we have some new data um, on the tracks of these historical storms. We have data from all the way back from 1900. Uh, for every year, we get a map that looks something like this. This happens to be 2003, uh, and it gives you the tracks of all of the, the uh, tropical cyclones in the different categories that occurred during that year. If we have time, I can show you the movie uh, of how this, this occurs over time. It's really quite, quite elaborate. We also have data on uh, the damages that were caused uh, by these storms and the deaths that were caused by the storms. Uh, <clears throat> and we have what, over a thousand storms that we looked at. Um, <clears throat> and this is also a, a plot of um, uh, the, their changing intensity and frequency. Uh, and you can see that um, all tropical cyclones have been increasing over that time period from 1900 in, until 2020. And particularly the ones that have caused damages or deaths, these are the ones that were used in the study, have been increasing also over that, over that time period. So we're able to look at the swath of the, uh, of the, the storm. We're able to look you know, using GIS data at the area of wetlands in the swath. Uh, the amount of infrastructure in the swath basically coming from nighttime satellite imagery. Uh, we know the damages that were caused by each hurricane. We know the, uh, <clears throat> we know the intensity uh, of the hurricanes. We put all that together uh, in a, a very elaborate uh, Bayesian statistical uh, model, which I won't go into the details of, and but we're able to estimate from that um, the total damages uh, that are avoided, uh, sort of the, the, the value of these, these coastal wetlands for storm protection uh, for you know, every pixel um, on the coast around, around the world. Uh, we, so we can sum all that up and our latest estimate is about $450 billion a year uh, in the avoided damages uh, due to the presence of, of coastal wetlands globally uh, with an average of about $11,000 per, per hectare per year. And we can break this down by country and, and et cetera. So, we can do some quite detailed analysis of what the value of these coastal wetlands. Um, what effect does this have on policy? Well, uh, it begins to get at the idea of nature-based solutions, uh, that rather than building levees and seawalls uh, along the coast to protect against storms, which only degrade, <clears throat> um, we can instead restore, rebuild coastal wetlands, uh, which provide 
not only storm protection, but this whole range of other ecosystem services. Oh yeah, we also were able to look, I think for the first time, at the, um, the lives saved by coastal wetlands. Um, annually about 4,500 lives are saved by the presence of these coastal wetlands uh, globally. And we can break that down by country as well. So we know when we lose these wetlands <clears throat> um, or other natural systems, uh, there's in general quite a loss of, of the value of that, of that landscape. Uh, we're losing a lot of the social function, the ecosystem services. We may be gaining some, some private values, uh, but in general, the total uh, is a net loss. This again is from the Millennium Assessment from several years ago. Uh, but I think these kinds of conclusions hold, hold pretty firm. Uh, <clears throat> many years ago now, we, we, we did an estimate of, well, what's the benefit cost ratio of conserving, protecting, restoring our natural capital assets globally? Uh, and uh, we used a, a global scenario that looked at uh, increasing the reserve network to cover 15% of the terrestrial biosphere and 30% of the marine biosphere. That would cost about $45 billion a year to build and maintain in 2002 dollars, I think that was. And I think there've been some, some other more recent estimates of what kind of investment we need in, in our natural capital assets. But the benefits, the difference between the intact system and what it might be converted to uh, were on the order of four to five trillion dollars a year. So benefit cost ratio of 100 to one, which is probably, um, I'm not sure you can find many better, better you know, investments these days. Maybe Angus can tell us from a banker's point of view if there's anything better out there. But the only better co benefit cost ratio I could find was for oil companies investing in political campaigns in the United States, which was about 400 to one, uh, <clears throat> unfortunately. Um, anyway, and there's been a lot of research uh, after this, I think, looking at nature-based nature -based solutions. You know, what, what kinds of benefits do we get from using uh, natural systems rather than engineered systems uh, to perform a lot of these functions. Um, since that 1997 paper, there's been a lot of research done. As I said, this is uh, from the TEAB study, the Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity. Uh, they updated uh, a lot of the estimates of the unit values per hectare per year of these different uh, ecosystems. Um, and we use that information then to say, well, how has the value globally changed uh, between 1997 and 2011. What's been happening to the value of these systems? Largely due to land use change. And we estimated that, uh, you know, over that time period, due to land use changes, desertification, loss of wetlands, loss of coral reefs, loss of many of the high valued systems or conversion to, uh, to lower valued systems, we're, we're losing a tremendous amount of the value of these ecosystem services. Um, this is how we did it. I won't go into the details here, but you know, we, we looked at how the area changed. We also looked, based on all that new research that I mentioned, at how the estimates of the unit values have changed, and those have consistently been going up, as we suspected, as we learn more about how these systems interact with human well-being, um, and how that, uh, and in the end, by changing the unit values and and the uh, area change, we get a you know an updated estimate of about 25, 125 trillion a year as the value of these ecosystem services uh, compared with um, <clears throat> the uh, changing the unit values only. So the difference, the difference here is about $20 uh, trillion a year in lost, in lost ecosystem services. Um, <clears throat> and it, we come back to this question of well, how much of these ecosystem services are already captured in GDP? Um, if we use this estimate of 125 trillion for global ecosystem services, 75 trillion for global GDP, just to give you that relative magnitude. We estimated something like you know, 36%, 27 trillion was already picked up in GDP and in food and raw materials and, and in recreational uh, values. Um, a more recent estimate, I think by the World Economic Forum was something like uh, <clears throat> 44 trillion. Uh, so uh, even, if, even larger percentage, but still um, a, lot of, a lot of the value that we're talking about is still outside the market. We also looked at um, how these values change going forward uh, under different scenarios. <laughs> Oops. Um, uh, based on the Great Transition Initiative scenarios, they have these four uh, scenarios that they've looked at out to 2050, uh, you know, business as usual kind of thing, a policy reform scenario, a collapse kind of scenario and a great transition scenario where we actually do invest in uh, restoring uh, and protecting uh, natural ecosystems. 
And you can see that um, the policy reform scenario is able to maybe stabilize things, but what we really need is a, a set of uh, policies that can rebuild uh, our ecosystem services and our, and our human well-being uh, <clears throat> going forward. There's a lot of new and different methods uh, and data and models uh, to assess these changes in the value of ecosystem services. This is a, a review paper that we did a few years ago. Uh, so if you're interested in learning more about, about uh, the range of methods, you know, there's a whole long list um, and all of the places where you can go to look at them. Uh, and I won't go into the details of these, but just to make it clear that there's, there's an active research agenda here uh, in how to better understand uh, these, these relationships. Um, I won't talk about much about it in this talk, but um, I think fair distribution is essential to quality of life. We know that you know, income inequality is, is uh, highly correlated. Uh, more income inequality leads to a whole uh, list of, of uh, increasing social problems. This is from uh, Kate Pickett and Richard Wilkinson's book, The Spirit Level, uh, across some of the OECD countries. Uh, and so <clears throat> uh, social capital and the ability to build social capital has, has a lot to do with how, how wealth and income is, is uh, distributed in society along with, uh, along with other cultural things. Uh, but that's an important component. I won't touch on too much, uh, <clears throat> but I will say uh, some things about how we do measure uh, our, our well-being going forward and what sort of policies uh, we're, we're using. And we have known you know, from the beginning uh, that, that GDP was never designed as a measure of, of societal well-being. This is a quote from Simon Kuznets, who was one of the architects of GDP. You know, you, you, uh, and he was very clear, you can't infer you know, uh, the welfare of a nation from, uh, from GDP. You have, if you're going to talk about growth, you have to talk about you know, growth of what and, and for what. What are we really trying to improve? And it's not just marketed economic activity. So, you know, it's well past time. I think we leave GDP behind, at least as a as a measure of our um, our our policy goals, our primary policy goals, and take a much broader look at the kinds of things that that we do need uh, to include. Um, in this paper, uh, we we put a partial list of some of the alternative indicators. Uh, that are out there, and there are literally, literally hundreds of them these days, uh, but you probably recognize a few of them uh, in addition to GDP, whoops. <clears throat> uh, um, and I'll talk a little bit about the genuine progress indicator, which at least tries to uh, take, uh, to modify uh, GDP for some of the, the, uh, the its, its, uh, its problems. And there are a few other uh, indicators like genuine savings or inclusive wealth that do, do something similar. Uh, there's a whole group that look directly at subjective well-being kinds of kinds of indicators. The World Value Survey, uh, the uh, Bhutanese Gross, Gross National Happiness Survey, and then there's a whole range of, of uh, indicators that are built up from a, a number of different things, like the Human Development Index was one of the first. The OECD Hap, uh, Better Life Index is probably one of the more recent ones. Um, <clears throat> they all have their own uh, issues uh, and, and problems. None of them are, are perfect. Uh, but I'll say something uh, a bit about the GPI. Uh, it starts with personal consumption, but then it weights it by income distribution. So it does get at the, the fairness and the distribution aspect uh, of this. Oops. Uh, it then adds a few things that are, uh, that are left out of GDP, but, but should be included, like the value of household labor and the value of volunteer work. And it subtracts a bunch of things that probably are best thought of as costs. The cost of crime, the cost of commuting, you know, the cost of underemployment, the cost of air and water pollution. Uh, so a whole range of things that do touch on at least uh, these four different types of capital that, that I mentioned at the, at the beginning. Um, <clears throat> there have been several countries that have uh, estimated countries and states and regions that have estimated the G GPI. Uh, here's a paper that we did back in 2013 where we tried to come up with a global estimate across all of those countries. And it was clear that you know, for a while, uh, we had some true economic growth where GDP and GPI were tracking each other. But since about 1980 or so, uh, GPI has been level or, or decreasing, even though GDP has been going up. Uh, you know, so we're, we're in a period of what Herman Daly has called uneconomic growth. The economy is growing. It's not really improving well-being. Well -being, so it's not really economic in, in that sense. We're, we're chasing the wrong goal, or at least we're ignoring uh, all of the costs of that additional e um, economic growth. And that's, I think, something we need to rectify. 
like I said, I think <clears throat> none of these systems are, are complete or, or uh, uh, yet, but I think there's a lot of work to be done on uh, modeling and measuring well-being and connect connection in particular with the, um, the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And this is a paper that we published recently that, that tries to get at some of those issues and how we might build some sort of hybrid indicator uh, that includes things that the GPI includes, but also subjective well-being indicators and also things, uh, <clears throat> things around um, uh, ecosystem services and the positive contributions of ecosystem services. So <clears throat> um, to create this sustainable well-being economy, I think it's going to take uh, you know, we've, we've known these problems, I think, uh, for decades now. And I think we've known the solutions for decades as well. Uh, so why haven't we made more progress? And so I think part of the problem is that we, we are really suffering from an addiction to this growth at all costs economic paradigm, the fossil fuels, the overconsumption by the rich. We're habituated to it. You know, it has a lot of positive short-term uh, reinforcements. But in the, in the end, we, we can see that it's leading to... Uh, to, to disaster. So uh, what's the therapy uh, that's involved in, in getting out of this, this uh, addiction or getting over it? And I'll show that uh, at least a key step in this ther therapy is building um, a shared vision that focuses more on directly on sustainable well-being of humans and the rest of nature. We published a paper along those lines, which asked the question, you know, what can we learn from individual therapies uh, to help us overcome this, um, this societal therapy? And one therapy that seems to work quite well is something called motivational interviewing, uh, which engages addicts in a positive discussion of their goals and motives and, and futures. It doesn't confront them directly with the problem, <clears throat> uh, but, but says, let's talk about what kind of life you want for yourself. Um, <clears throat> and that's something that we could scale up, I think, to the uh, societal scale. What kind of world do we want uh, for society? How do we build that shared vision you know, for where we want to go? As, Famous American uh, philosopher Yogi Berra once said, "You know, if you don't know where you're going, you end up somewhere else. So where are we going? Where do, where are we going as a as a species, as a community, as a society? Uh, <clears throat> I think the um, the SDGs are certainly a important step in that direction. Uh, you know, it's the first time in human history, really, when all sovereign countries in the world have agreed on a set of goals that's that's much broader uh, than simply you know uh, more growth." Uh, and I'm sure you've all seen these over, over and over again, uh, but um, I think it is a significant step, but it's really only the first step. Um, they're all presented as independent goals, and in fact, we know that there are complex synergies and trade-offs and interactions among these goals. They all contribute to these three uh, sub-goals that I, I mentioned in, in ecological economics of sustainable scale, fair distribution, efficient allocation. They all contribute in various ways to that. And to the overarching goal of, you know, a prosperous, high quality of life that's equitably shared and sustainable. So, um, I think it's going to take a lot more research and work to understand how those interactions work, uh, and in different countries, in different contexts, etc. Uh, but, but recognizing that we do have an overarching goal, and we do have, uh, and that goal is quite different from from just goal number eight, wherever it is, which is. Uh, you know, economic uh, economic growth. I even changed the language here. It really should be economic prosperity, not necessarily economic growth. But in the current version, growth is still in there. So, how do we create that that shared vision? Um, this is a book we published a few years ago, where we asked uh, 45 you know global thought leaders uh, to to give us uh, essays along those lines. And I think you'll find this quite interesting reading. You know, if they uh, they talk about what kind of world they see. Uh, the Great Transition Initiative <clears throat> um, has been uh, looking at uh, different global scenarios and this whole idea of scenario planning and scenario building and, and uh, imaginaries and, and et cetera, I think is an important way to do that. What kind of uh, worlds are possible and plausible? And can we use that information to help uh, spur this discussion about the kind of world that we really want? Um, <clears throat> the, um, you know, the, the Great Transition Initiative, I think, overlaps quite a bit with the uh, sustainable development goals and all of the things that are that are trying to be incorporated there, except maybe number number eight. Uh, <clears throat> and how do we communicate those goals and those alternative futures to a much broader audience? Uh, you know, the policy community maybe understands these, but I think if you did a survey of anywhere people anywhere in the world and asked them, you know, do they even know what the sustainable development goals are? Um, I'm sure you would not get a very high percentage of people who who, uh, who have even heard of them. 
So how do we how do we get that uh, the the global public, uh, civil society engaged in talking about thinking about uh, alternative futures and the kinds of futures that they really want? It's going to take more uh, participation from the arts community, you know, from the humanities, etc. How do we how do we paint pictures? How do we how do we do uh, films and videos and things that will that will make those things more obvious? Uh, <clears throat> one thing we tried in Australia was a public opinion survey where we uh, created uh, a set of scenarios for Australia. It's quite similar to the Great Transition ones with slightly different wording to be what we hoped was a little less value laden. Uh, and then we had people uh, go online, <clears throat> um, we invited them to take the survey. We got about 2000 uh, uh, <clears throat> representative samples, about 2000 from across Australia uh, to read about the, the different scenarios. Um, fairly quick descriptions of, of each of these four uh, scenarios, and then to take a survey and say, you know, which ones do they prefer? And the results look something like this. We've got about 72% who ranked community well-being either num number one or number two. So there was a clear majority of people who really preferred uh, a, a world that was more equitable, that was more sustainable, um, et cetera. We also asked them, you know, which scenario they thought the country was headed toward. And there was a clear majority who thought that the free enterprise, you know, sort of business as usual scenario was where the country was headed. And I think you probably get that in many countries these days where uh, <clears throat> a majority of people are beginning to realize uh, that, that that world is not really where we want to go. We want to go here. How do we make that transition? How do we, uh, how do we get, uh, how do we implement that therapy? Um, <clears throat> it's also important, I think, to think about new institutions for how we manage our, our natural capital assets. And this idea of thinking of them as common assets, as community assets, rather than, than uh, as private assets or even as national assets, I think is an important, um, important step. And uh, <clears throat> so we've been uh, working on doing that at multiple scales. And this is all based on the work of Eleanor Ostrom, uh, who has shown that, that you know, it is possible to manage the commons sustainably and well. Uh, you know, and the, and the, the uh, uh, the places that she's studied where it has worked, uh, you know, has a clear set of, of principles or, or guidelines or characteristics uh, that they all, they all seem to have. You have to have clearly defined boundaries. You have to be able to, uh, <clears throat> to define these areas as property, but, but the property belongs to the community and the community has to be involved in uh, creating the rules and implementing the rules and, and, and enforcing the rules. So uh, there's a whole, I think, institutional design uh, agenda um, out there uh, about how do we how do we create uh, the kinds of institutions that can manage the global commons, like the atmosphere, or like the oceans, uh, in a way that uh, the more more local commons have been effectively managed um, in in, uh, in in some cases. Um, and finally, <clears throat> how do we build the the uh, uh, the civil society movement, the, the community, uh, uh, the the, the uh, how do we bring all of these pieces together? Uh, in order to make uh, make progress, and I've been involved in helping to set up the Wellbeing Economy Alliance, which I hope some of you have heard about. Um, <clears throat> this was from a meeting in Scotland in 2017, um, <clears throat> hosted by Nicola Sturgeon, uh, where um, the <clears throat> uh, we all sort of got started. Uh, and the, the basic idea is that there are many, many, many uh, groups around the world that I think are thinking similar thoughts, uh, but they're not coordinated. They're not working together. They're not a united front. How do we build an alliance among all of those groups uh, to, 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 uh, to move uh, the system, to move the dial uh, a bit? Uh, <clears throat> one important uh, part of that is the government component. And uh, there's a very good TED talk that I encourage you to take a look at by Nicholas Sturgeon about the Wellbeing Economy Governments Group, uh, which was established in 2018 and includes New Zealand and Scotland and um, Finland and Iceland and Wales, I think at the moment. Uh, <clears throat> I think there's many other countries that they're talking to to, to try to get to join. It's interesting that uh, Germany now has a new uh, green minister uh, along these lines. And so even uh, <clears throat> some highly developed countries and, and bigger countries might, might get on board. Certainly uh, New Zealand has been a, a leader uh, in, this, in this regard and has created a, a well-being budget. Uh, but also Iceland and Finland, uh, et cetera. So um, we are sort of in a crisis uh, still, I think with, with COVID and, and, and other things. How do we build back better after this crisis? And, and uh, can we use this opportunity 
really to begin to uh, to chip to to uh, implement this tipping point, the social tipping point, um, to get toward and start working towards uh, the kind of world that I think we all want. So thank you. Thank you ever so much, uh, Professor Constanza. That was an uh, amazing talk. We covered so much ground from uh, value and valuation to policy reforms to uh, uh, therapy and, and addiction. And then uh, obviously finishing on the Alliance, I felt was uh, an excellent place to um, uh, think about some of the, the challenges uh, of, of how we bring about this vision. Um, I'm going to uh, ask you a few questions myself, but before I do, I just want to remind all our audience who are joining us that there's the Q&A facility, uh, and I would invite you to type your questions there. I can see that we've already had uh, a couple uh, contribution, uh, and I'll come to those in, in just a second. Um, so if I can um, use my privilege as chair just to start things off, um, and I was really fascinated by this idea of addiction and therapy and, and some of the work you've started to do there. Um, and I was curious, actually, I've just read the this morning the paper by our colleagues at CUSP, the Centre for Understanding Sustainable Prosperity at uh, uh, Surrey, who are, who are writing about um, fiscal policy and monetary policy in the UK. And, and one of the uh, issues we have in that area is, of course, that um, certain renderings uh, or certain uh, orthodox economic approaches treat the, the nation like the household when the relationship's very different when it comes to money creation. So the, the reason I'm making this comparison is uh, I noted that you're making that jump from individual to society. Um, so I just want you to tease out a little bit about, you know, how you think a society is like an individual and also where is society is not like individuals uh, when mm -hmm. it comes to this issue of addiction and, and then therapy. Thank you. That's a very good question. <laughs> and that's one of the main, <clears throat> I guess, uh, critiques that we got on, on that paper that we're not, you know, like, who's the therapist when you're talking about society as a whole? And can societies actually be addicted in the same way that, that individuals can? And obviously, you know, societies are more than just the aggregate of all of the individuals. I think societies are a complex systems, system in, in their own right. And in that sense, I think we can deal with them as a complex system, like you can deal with an individual as a complex system, but recognize that there are different different parts and different different characteristics of those of those systems. Uh, so, but I, I think what we took away from it uh, really was that um, that a necessary ingredient uh, for making changes, you know, in in any complex system, uh, is is to have you know a clear goal of what where you're headed, and that works for businesses. It works for you know. I think there's lots of evidence. Uh, to support that uh, that idea, uh, <clears throat> that without a clear goal, you know, we're all moving in, in different directions. The society is not really not really uh, <clears throat> making progress. I think actually we we do have a clear goal in, in many cases, but that clear goal is maximize GDP at all costs, and I think that's that's part of the that's part of the problem, and and also part of the uh, <clears throat> the confirmation <laughs> that that. Uh, that yes, if you do have a clear goal, you're going to you're going to get movement towards that goal. Uh, but if it's the wrong goal, uh, then then uh, then we have a problem. And if we know that that goal is leading us in the wrong direction, uh, then we have a, a severe problem. So I guess I guess the key thing is how do we change a societal goal? How do we make uh, how do we make um, community decisions? Um, you know uh, about uh, about our lives. I think that's always that's been a, an ongoing problem. Uh, in, mm -hmm. in, many, in many fields, uh, how do we make those decisions better? How do we improve governance, uh, if, if you will? And certainly our, our, our democratic forms of governments, our quote, quote unquote democratic forms of government these days, uh, don't seem to be doing a very good job of that. And maybe it's because, you know, majority, straight out majority rule uh, doesn't necessarily give us, you know, the best, the best uh, collective decisions. And there are some ideas for, for how to improve that. Uh, going forward, so which we can talk about maybe in another another mm -hmm. seminar. Yeah, <laughs> I 
I, I wanted to, I mean, another uh, thing that you said that was really fascinating, I, I wanted to hear a little bit more about alliance, almost as a conceptual term. And I was thinking about this in relation to the work the IGP has done on, on prosperity and what our prosperity indexes have, have showed, which is something, you know, we've argued conceptually too, is that ideas about prosperity are very much localised. Um, um, and so we we do need these kind of forms of local engagement, but yet clearly, as you've you've argued, when we've got a planetary system, we need a kind of overarching goal too. So I'm curious. I guess the question is, how does alliance bring that sense of overarching goal, but then difference together? How does it negotiate uh, that terrain? Well, maybe um, Ostrom's idea about polycentric governance uh, gets gets partly at that. I mean, <clears throat> I think there are some um, overarching goals that apply to, to to people, to individuals, to societies at, at all scales, uh, but obviously there are going to be some local differences as well. And so <clears throat> being able to deal with with both of those, you know, what is what are the things that we all agree on? You know, and and I think uh, we can we can build those those sorts of things. We all we all agree on you know prosperity in the sense of of uh, security and fairness and you know <clears throat> sustainability. I think, uh, <clears throat> but we're not we're not getting those things at any of those scales right now. Um, so <clears throat> yeah, it is important to think about how these scales interact with each other and what and uh, and and how we can manage that effectively. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I, I'm conscious that we've we've only got half an hour, which doesn't seem enough time, but um, let's see how we get on. Um, I'd like to now invite my colleague Angus Armstrong to come in, and then I'm going to go to the Q&A. And, and then I did see Jackie that you raised your hand, so I'll come to you then. Uh, so Angus, please. Thank you very much indeed, Chris, and thank you, Bob. Um, I have two questions. Um, the first one is about GDP. and I'm always intrigued uh, how people in, uh, often talk about degrowth. Um, and clearly there's some uh, units of GDP which use a lot of CO2, uh, emit a lot of CO2, um, and others which don't. I mean, you know, people pay for services to hear a comedian and they don't use that much CO2 or emit that much CO2. So, uh, it's not entirely obvious to me that you have to have degrowth uh, to have a more intelligent way of, of organizing the economy. So that's my first point. And the second point, um, I can see the attraction in calling our natural resources um, uh, physical capital, but there's also, it always strikes me as a real danger that is the metaphor to um, capital as Marx used it and other people have used it over the last 150 years or so, is it really accurate? Because uh, it inevitably invites the idea of a rate of return, the idea you can put in a production function, the idea that exists in the domain of one pound, one vote, all of which are, I assume, completely against what you're trying to get at, which is this is everybody's and it's not a one pound, one vote world, it's one person, one vote world. Right. But by putting a value on it, it seems to take it that way. So for example, um, how do we value people? We, we usually cringe at that idea. And no matter how bad somebody is, we tend not to put them to death in the UK because we say human life is sacrosanct. Mm -hmm. And in a way, the environment is as well. It's beyond value. It's beyond putting a price on it. And so in some ways, there's a danger that it leads you into economics when this is actually sacrosanct. You can't live without it. Mm -hmm. And so... I just I, do you share those tensions when you when you when you think about this um, yeah. by putting pounds or dollars I guess signs to them? Yeah, let me talk about the first one first. Uh, yeah. This um, I'm more of a fan of a growth rather than degrowth. Uh, so I think I think GDP measures market activity, and that may or may not have the negative side effects that we're that we're talking about. Uh, but I think you should um, think about the larger goals first. And, and GDP is a means to an end. It's not the end in itself. So I think that the, the direction is, is wrong, you know, that, that the well-being goals come, come first. And I think that's true as regards the second question as well, uh, that in fact, we are talking about the health and well-being of, of the whole planet, of the whole society, uh, of the economy. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, the capital term, I think, is useful in communicating with 
uh, with with some people. Um, it may cause other people to go off in the in the wrong direction. But I think the the the, uh, the qualifiers I think are are extremely important because capital you know in general means a stock that produces a flow of of, of benefits. Uh, so <clears throat> natural capital uh, is a stock of of natural resources of natural ecosystems. They're producing, you know, a flow of benefits to people. Uh, how you measure those benefits, I think, is is another question. Um, I think the problem, well, um, yeah, the idea of how do you measure those benefits and how do you compare them with uh, with other things that are also benefits, I think, is is uh, is part of the issue. If you say that, you know, the environment sacrosanct, we can't. We can't touch it. We can't do anything to it. Well, uh, we are touching it. We are doing things to it all the time. Uh, so we're obviously not not fulfilling that that argument, and probably never have. Uh, so it's really more about how do we interact with uh, the rest of nature. You know, it's not us and nature as two separate things, as we're part of this whole complex system. Uh, so under, understanding that that complexity, I think, doesn't. It's not really helpful. Uh, to think of us as, as as nature as being something separate and sacred out there, separate from 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 us. Uh, you know, the whole idea behind a lot of environmental protection has has been, you know, we have to restore these systems to what they used to look like. You know, sometime before before people were here. Uh, you know, how do we remove human interaction from quote unquote natural systems? Um, I think that. I think that's not a very helpful uh, way of way of managing, uh, you know, the rest of nature, or our interaction with it uh, going forward. Um, we we try to make the point that um, expressing these values in in monetary units is really a way of communicating and comparing the values, not necessarily saying that they're part of the market economy. We're saying the exact the exact opposite. They're outside the market, but they still contribute uh, to well-being in units that. In, in not in all cases, but in some cases, you know, we can we can convert into um, <clears throat> to something comparable. And <clears throat> we've always argued that, yeah, this is not the only way to do it. it. It may not be the best way for some for some cases, but it's also not mutually exclusive with other ways of, of talking about the value of, of natural systems. Uh, so, <clears throat> um, yeah, I hope that <laughs> that helps. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Angus, for those questions. So I'm now going to uh, come to the Q&A and I just want to know that Kate Pickett uh, offered a comment that we uh, put uh, value on human life all the, all the time in insurance uh, when in estimating the cost effectiveness of a healthcare. So that was more of a comment that uh, I'm just going to share. Uh, yeah, I'm maybe, gonna... maybe I'll maybe I'll pick up on that a little bit as well, or just to, to, to reconfirm that. Yeah, that and that doesn't conflict with the idea that we don't want to, you know, execute people or, the, or that, that human life is sacred. It's just that, yes, we do value human life all the time. We value ecosystem services all the time by the choices that we make and, and the investments that we make. So we might as well make that, you know, more obvious uh, while at the same time recognizing, you know, um, how far you can go with that. And like I always say, you know, all models are wrong. But some models are useful, uh, so and some models are more useful than others for different purposes. So, how do we how do we build models that that are effective at achieving the goals that we're that, that we're after? And uh, in in the case that that we were after, uh, <clears throat> I think uh, you know expressing the value of ecosystem services in monetary units that could be compared with GDP, I think had a big effect uh, because it made the point that we were trying to make that these 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 uh, services were huge and important, and you can no longer afford to ignore them as as people had been doing. Okay, so actually, the the next question I'm about to read out, um, I think, ties in nicely with with exactly this line of questioning. Um, so it's from Adrian Plomto, one of our PhD students uh, and a, a colleague too. Um, and Adrian says, uh, thank you very much for the interesting presentation. You have talked about how ecosystem services have a high value in monetary terms. But if the end goal of the economy is to increase well-being, then shouldn't ecosystem services be measured in terms of how they impact well-being? And, and the question is, are there some valuation techniques of ecosystem services that focus on that? So looking well, at those I, alternate yeah. types of valuation. 
I would argue that they all focus on that. Um, and the question is how how do you measure them and how do you how do you express those values? And they could be expressed in other units besides besides money. Uh, you know, so they could be expressed in, in index units. They could be expressed in energy units. They could be expressed in time units. They could be expressed in something. But you need some way of of intercomparing. I think uh, the things that contribute to well-being from different sources, shall we say? And if all of those things are in different units, then it's hard to make that that intercomparison and say, you know, how are we balancing out those different those different contributions? And and I'm not arguing that we have solved that that problem. Um, and I'm, I'd be totally open to uh, new ways of, of measuring, comparing, um, you know, uh, uh, or, uh, you know, and, and uh, um, well, and, and indices that might, might work better. Uh, and certainly the idea of using index numbers has, has, uh, has gotten a lot, uh, a lot of play, uh, but that has, you know, all of the underlying problems that are still there. How do you weight the different components of the index? And who's going to do the weighting? And, how is that done? So, uh, <clears throat> yeah, it's it's uh, it's not a, a problem that we've solved. But I th like I said, um, you know, all models are wrong, but but uh, some are some are useful. Yeah. Um, thank you, Adrian, for that question. We now have a question um, from our colleague David Bent, and then I'm coming to you, Jackie. Don't worry, I didn't forget. Um, <laughs> so, um, David asks quite a broad question: What are the strongest good faith arguments against your proposition, and how do you respond to them? Um, well, I guess we've already had a couple of those that seem to come up <laughs> most of the, most of the time. Um, David, do you have any anything particular in mind on on your end? Okay, uh, so we'll we'll wait for David to to type <laughs> into the chat, um, and we'll we'll come to Jackie. Okay. Oh, well, so mine's not. Hi, thanks, Bob. That was great. It's like a, like going down the historical lanes of all the things. It's brilliant. So I have a really stupid question, which is, given that um, I, I find it fascinating that Biden is you know facing. He faced a lot of backlash around his only two trillion pound, just two, which was going to build, I don't know, was it 20,000 miles of road and 10,000 bridges? So it, do you think that the appetite for large numbers, because clearly you're talking about a lot of large numbers when you're discussing you know, the, the damage reduction and so on. I mean, do you think that if you were to have published your paper today, the one you published at the end of the 90s, which valued the ecosystem services of the planet. Do you think that there's more appetite to understand these large numbers in in the kind of in the broader world as opposed to you know the academic side of it? Because it seems to me that it could be the moment where people could compare twenty thousand miles of road and ten thousand bridges with the whole of the natural capital and the natural world and get a much better ability to weigh things up. Mm. Is this the time now to talk about you know? trusts and land and restoring nature. I think it's always been the time. <laughs> but, yeah, I know that, but you had to do it. <laughs> but I don't know, what do you think? Do you think people are more open to talking about these larger scale issues? Uh, I mean, we are more of a global, a global economy. People can communicate with people all over I mean, the my world. Sense is, so yeah, I, I mean, my, my sense is that the general public are getting more and more used to juggling with very large numbers. And I think if you were to put, for example, the cost of the vaccination programs, I mean, from development all the way through, together with, you know, a rebuilding our roads and infrastructure, and then put nature at the end of it, I suspect that it wouldn't look quite so um, out of kilter as it did when the paper first came out in the late 90s. So I guess it's about, you know, has the public got a different perception, you think, because of all these different things that have gone on at the global level, and whether it's whether it's now the time to really put that valuation of nature back on the table. Maybe, uh, but I think, I think we can and should do a lot more um, survey work you know, uh, of, the, of the global uh, population. Like I said, you know, do you think, uh, what fraction of the, of the population in the world has ever heard of the SDGs, for example? You know, I think that was a significant step. I would say it's probably not large, but I think they could be. Uh, inform better, and they probably would be on board much more uh, with those goals if they could be, yeah. you know, communicated uh, <clears throat> uh, more more effectively. Uh, I don't think putting out 17 different goals like that is an effective way to communicate them. But if you 
you know, if we if we came up with some creative ways, you know, uh, using using videos and and etc. That said, oh, here's what the world would look like if if the SDGs were were implemented in your country, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, or some some creative ways of engaging uh, the general population and, and thinking about. Uh, alternative futures, essentially, and thinking about uh, what they really want, you know, for the future of the world. And certainly in the so, younger, yeah. <laughs> All right, so we, I think I think we got the answer. I think Henrietta now has to pay for lots of nice little short films that are really inspirational about what could the world look like. I think that would yes. be interesting. I have one in mind. Actually, have you seen the film 2040? Yeah. Yes. So we've been talking with the guy who did that one, uh, Damon Jimmo. And he's he's willing to do a short film uh, that that will sort of address some of these issues. We just need to find a uh, not a very large amount of funding for it, but I think we can. Let's talk about that. Right, back to David, who may have sent you the message back, Chris. I don't know. <laughs> well, uh, David has uh, has come back to us, okay, and, and it's in response to just your conversation now rather than his earlier question. So mm -hmm. he he's noted that Grist has a climate fiction competition asking people to write about a hopeful and realistic world in twenty or two thousand and two hundred, and he's provided the link, uh, and okay. the entry date is the fifth of of May. So I think um, uh, ev everyone hopefully can. Uh, see that I think because the Q and A is public, so um, right. that's a, a, a that's lovely good. provocation. <laughs> two thousand two hundred is maybe um, too far out there, but um, I think we need something a little closer. I don't know if you've seen uh, the book uh, "The Ministry for the Future" by Kim Stanley Robinson. Have you run across that one? Mm -hmm. uh, which is a sort of near term. Uh, <clears throat> eventually, it's a positive future, but but I think he does, you know the really interesting, you know, uh, combination of uh, disasters that happen and how they're responded to and how, you know, so it, I think it's a very well done um, um, uh, book in this genre, you know, of alternative futures uh, and how things could turn out, you know, how to create plausible, positive futures, uh, not, and they're not going to be boring, you know, and there's going to be problems. And so they have to be plausible, uh, but they can't be uh, but they don't necessarily have to be um, dystopias. And I think in the past, what we've mainly gotten, you know, from the from the arts community, from the movies, are are dystopias. Mm. And uh, on that on that um, uh, topic, what uh, have you read? Uh, engage. I suspect you may have Donna Haraway staying with the trouble, and the the vision of the future there, which I think is neither well. Uh, thought about as a, a utopia or a dystopia um, and I'm, I'm saying this because David's come with a follow-up uh, to his original question he says I'm more interested in what the limits or the weaknesses you see yourself all of this seems so obvious and well evidenced but there's no is there no counter argument or other <laughs> position which is well evidenced and I think what what Haraway offers is a world of hybrids and a, a radically different way of of living that, that, you know, in that little image, it, it's nothing like that. It, it, it's yeah. a, a great transition that, that it changes radically the way we live, but. Right. Well, and to answer David's question, I mean, <clears throat> to me, it does seem obvious and well evidenced. <laughs> so uh, the counter arguments don't seem to hold much water, but um, <clears throat> unless he has something particular in mind, mm. uh, <clears throat> I don't know. <laughs> maybe, Angus, maybe Angus is the one to, to address this, that, uh, you know, what, what are the counter arguments that, that you think are most, are most compelling? Uh, <clears throat> well, since you've asked, um, maybe <laughs> want to do that challenge. Uh, I, I'm struggling to work out why the value of natural resources isn't infinity. Since um, everything that can ever be produced or live is a, a stream of goods, services, people, life, forever, depends on this, doesn't that make the real value infinity? Well, in fact, in our 1997 paper, we said exactly that, <clears throat> that in, in the end, in the end, it's, uh, you know, if you eliminated all natural, natural capital, obviously, the life on earth would, would end. Mm -hmm. uh, so in that sense, in that sense, yes. However, 
um, <clears throat> right now, um, you know, there's a balance of those four types of capital that are contributing uh, to well-being. And if you modify <clears throat> that balance, uh, you're going to get uh, a change in that in that uh, in that contribution. So, and like I said, you know, we are valuing those those systems because we're making changes in that in that balance all the time. And you know, by making making a change, you know, by eliminating a, a wetland, uh, the whole world doesn't disappear. Uh, you know, that's really an extreme case. If you got rid of all agriculture, the, you know, the society, society, well, we go back to hunting and gathering, I guess, but, you know, the, the, the civilizations uh, would, would end if you got rid of all infrastructure. Uh, so any of those types of capital assets, I think, are, are required in some more balanced way, in an ongoing way. So you're not really talking about the end game. You're talking about what's going on now and what's going on in the, you know, in the, in the relatively relatively short-term future and how do you get the balance right i guess is really what we're what we're talking about but yeah it's also true that in the end <laughs> uh the whole system would fall apart i mean perhaps it's the um <clears throat> the rate at which the earth can replenish itself right mm -hmm. so it, if it's the rate at which you can replenish itself then that's the sort of sustainable amount of resources you can consume. Right, yes, um, indeed, indeed, right. And, and the other thing is, you know, that natural capital doesn't behave the same way as built capital or human Absolutely. capital or social capital. They have completely, they have different characteristics. Natural capital is self-regenerating. You know, <clears throat> uh, we have a paper that we that came out recently about discounting, you know, which is important in terms of making these long-term decisions and the fact that we, shouldn't discount natural capital and built capital in the same way or at the same rate because they they're completely different characteristics you know yeah. and, and uh, we don't have to continue to invest in in natural capital we need to protect it conserve it you know uh, <clears throat> in various ways but you know it will do its own thing and and we will benefit from that yeah. uh, <clears throat> likewise likewise social capital is completely you know completely different characteristics uh, <clears throat> so they're not the same thing. And, and I think just because we're calling them capital, you know, if you can come up with another term, you could say assets, you could say something else, but you know, I think the general use of the term as a stock, uh, you know, that, that contributes a flow of, uh, of benefits is kind of the general term that we're using. And the modifiers are there to make it clear that they're very different kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna move right. us I'm on. I'm not sure if you answered. I'm not sure if you answered David's question. But <laughs> back to that later. <laughs> um, I'm. I'm. Yeah. Uh, with apologies to David, I'm gonna move us on. You'll see we've got a, a room full of colleagues and students uh, who are on campus. I, I can't quite see uh, who's in charge, but I've been told Manolo has a question, and I think Manolo, we can see you. So please, yeah, yeah ask your question. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, there is a question that came to my mind. Well, with, with this acknowledgement of GDP as, a, as an unfavorable way of measure, it's increasingly understood in a macro level. But in a meso level, almost every company has profit max maximization, ultimately as their sense of existence, as their main goal. In this need for a social therapy, how can a transition of objectives could be made in what has been basically their essence uh, all, their, all their time, all their life? Do we have the time for companies to overcome this addiction, especially when society in general keeps on praising individual wealth and that kind of thing, dynamic? Yeah, yeah uh, that's a really important question. Um, and I think there, there are some positive things happening in that direction. There's a benefit for benefit or the B corporation movement, uh, which uh, intends to change the fundamental goals of, of corporations and say the fundamental goal should be, you know, the, the improvement of, of society like corporations were originally uh, designed, designed to be. It's not just about short-term profit maximization. It's about, it's about, it's about societal benefits. So that gets back to the addiction therapy that, you know, if you can change the goal uh, to something, to something, you know, more appropriate, uh, then that can, that can help uh, to, to lead changes in that direction. Um, the other point is that uh, the business community is often sort of lumped together in, in a monolithic way. And I think 
uh, I think there are, at, there, there are parts of the community uh, that are the, the real problem these days and other parts that are, that are, that are probably much more willing to, uh, uh, to, to go towards a more sustainable society. And the, the problem parts are the, are the fossil fuel sector. Uh, you know, so that they're the ones who have known for a long time. Gus Beth has a has a new book out called "They Knew," you know, which goes through all the whole history of. It's just like the tobacco industry. You know, they've they've known the the problems with climate climate change uh, for decades, uh, and yet they invest in misinformation campaigns and lobbying. You know, and uh, uh, they 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 get huge subsidies. You know, to continue to operate in ways that are not really socially beneficial. In fact, they're perverse subsidies uh, from a societal point of view. So I think we need to distinguish, you know, those different parts of the, the business community and, and start to go after uh, the, the problem of businesses. Um, and, and that will help accelerate uh, the transition to renewable energy and towards a sustainable future. Uh, and there are there are some movements in that direction. You know, there's uh, states in the U.S. that are beginning to sue uh, fossil fuel companies for damages. Uh, they're class action suits. You know, so it's kind of the the uh, tobacco uh, uh, class action suits. You know, taken to a, a larger scale. Uh, <clears throat> there's a, a movement called Claim the Sky that um, that you could uh, take a look at on on the web. We're trying to. Uh, to say that that we should really think of the atmosphere as a common asset uh, trust uh, that we all that we all benefit from and that we all in a sense own together, uh, and so we should manage it uh, in that way, and we should begin to charge you know those who damage that asset um, you know for the damages and use those revenues to restore the uh, restore the asset to make sure that climate uh, uh, <clears throat> stays within the 1.2 degree limit that we've set. So. Uh, that um, mention of Gus Speth moves us very nicely on to what I promise Robert will be the, the last question, because I think you've done a grand job. But um, our colleague Andrew Percy, who leads our work on social prosperity, says environmental activists like Gus Speth have come to see progress on social issues as the necessary precursor, or to put it another way around, the barrier to galvanizing public support focus action on larger issues. Including, including the global ecosystem commons. So his question is, how do you arrange the social ecosystem and economic priorities to get real progress? So I think going back to that diagram you showed us um, yeah. towards the beginning. Right, well, good question, Andrew. If you have some ideas there, I'm, I'm happy to, to entertain them. <laughs> but uh, I think there's probably a whole range of ways that uh, that that this can be done but I think the the well-being um, economy alliance is one you know one version of that but I think some social movements I think it has to become a social movement uh, in a sense and and how to kick off those and coordinate those social movements because I think we've seen that you know there's an appetite there you know we had the uh, uh, the, the climate emergency movement you know we had uh, the you know, we've had several uh, sort of civil society movements, but they don't, they don't seem to go anywhere. They kind of go for a while and then fizzle out. How do we coordinate all of those things? Because they're all headed, you know, I think toward the same goal, uh, but they're coming at it in, a, in too limited a way. And we need to, 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 to build this broader alliance, I think, uh, to, make, uh, to make the system, to make the, uh, the changes happen. Um, and it's gonna take some leadership as well. I know some, so, uh, I'm not sure who those those leaders are going to turn out to be, but I think uh, to make this tipping point happen, those leaders will will emerge, you know, and will and will help to galvanize. I think the um, the movement going forward. So <clears throat> I'm hopeful that we are close to that sort of social tipping point. Uh, and we've seen in the past that these things do sort of happen in as a tipping point sort of phenomenon. I mean, who would have predicted the Soviet Union falling apart? you know, when it did from the outside. Uh, from the inside, <clears throat> you know, things were changing, things were happening gradually, you know, there was there was dissatisfaction, but, and there were some, there was, you know, some triggers like like Chernobyl, uh, some crises that were, that were beginning to happen. But then, you know, all of a sudden it seemed like, hey, the whole thing fell apart. <clears throat> Who saw that coming really? Uh, so I think we're in a similar kind of situation where it looks pretty bad, 
but there's a lot of good things actually going on below the surface. Um, we started a journal 10 years ago called Solutions, which is uh, intended to be a venue for uh, all these positive things that are, that are already happening. Because uh, I think people don't know about all of the, the positive things that are happening. How do we communicate that? And that's gonna, I think, gonna be uh, needed to help build the movement as well. Uh, and building this, this shared vision of you know, the kind of world we're trying, trying to build, I think that's, that's still gonna be a key element. You know, once we have that relatively, relatively established, um, I think that becomes a, uh, you know, a, a way to, to draw people into the movement and also to, to, help, uh, to help achieve that, those goals. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's an absolutely excellent place to finish with hope and with purpose. And Andrew's just left a comment. I look forward to working with you at IGP to make the progress we want to see on these issues. Glad to have you here. And I think that really captures uh, every, everyone's sentiment. It, it's really wonderful to have you as part of our community, Bob. And it, and it was a really wonderful talk uh, this afternoon or this evening, depending on where everyone is. So thank you ever so much uh, for, for talking to us and and thanks to all the panelists and uh, everyone else who's attended we really appreciate your uh, participation i hope you've enjoyed it um i'm gonna quickly just advertise our next talk in this series which is called pollinators productivity and pesticide use in urban farming and that's going to be next thursday at one o'clock it's a talk by dr beth nichols and you know who doesn't love bees uh, so we're just going to finish in the traditional way and uh, I want the the lecture theatre to unmute itself in particular because you've got a critical mass with our round of applause so please join me in thanking Bob for the talk. Thank you all looking forward to working with you all. Thank you thank you everyone and uh, good evening.